Progressive Talk. I'm Bev Cowling, your senior millennial here, and I am excited to have a good friend of mine with us tonight. His name is Steve Grumbine. I met Steve on Facebook a few years ago and then had the great pleasure of having him come to my rally in Washington, D.C. just a year ago, a few days. It was the 24th of July and um, met him in person. He spoke so eloquently about MMT and I've been anxiously waiting to get him on the show to discuss this important topic that I don't understand nearly as well as I need to because I find economics boring. So, but Steve, say hi, and um, we'll uh, get a little bit into this in a minute. But we do have a couple of things we got to discuss. You know, uh, <laughs> we got to talk about Cheeto. You know, <laughs> just got to talk about him. You know. Um, He's been saying no collusion, no collusion, no collusion. And now today he humbly says, well, collusion isn't a crime. <laughs> you know, Giuliani says collusion isn't a crime, but guess what? Collusion is part of conspiracy, which is a crime, you know? And uh, so all of a sudden, why is he saying there's been no collusion? Oh, but it's not a crime. You know, it, it's just ridiculous. And that, of course, then in a tweet, then he tells, tells Jeff Sessions that he's got to ask Mueller to stop this Russian investigation. Well, you know what? Sessions can't do that because Session has recused himself from anything having to do with the Russian investigation. So, you know, for him to be tweeting this nonsense, is just more is indicative of what an idiot he is. And then you got to talk about the video where he was talking about the the um, F-35 planes, you know, <laughs> with this lady from Lockheed. And he was talking about the stealth plane. Guess what, everybody? We're buying them. We're still buying them. We're still using them. And guess what? They're invisible. You can't see them. Nobody can see them. This is what he's telling everybody in this press conference. It's an invisible plane. Can you get more idiotic? I swear. Anyway. I have one other little thing I'd like to talk about. <clears throat> I was talking on Facebook this week about Bernie's uh, plan for student loan forgiveness, which I think is a wonderful plan. And I got to say, I could not have been more disappointed in some of the responses that I got immediately back. What about me? I've been paying off my student loans. Do I get forgiven? Or is somebody going to pay me back for the money I've paid? Mm. You know, um, it hurts my heart to think that we begrudge anybody getting something that we may not have gotten. But I'm here to tell you somewhere down the line through your life, you've gotten a break that they didn't get. It's, it's never going to be even Stephen with every specific thing. But I will also tell you that the student loans that people are incurring now are far greater amounts and far higher interest rates than what you had. Because when I went to college back in 1972, I got to go for an entire year on $1,000. Mm. That's all I had to borrow. And that included my books a whole year. And that was a local university. And now that one semester at that college is $13,000. So when you talk about your student loans and you may have borrowed eight or 10,000, they they're borrowing 40 and 50 and 60,000. There is absolutely no comparison. So to those of you who say, what about me? I would ask you to think, wouldn't you someday down the line, hope that there will be people standing up for your sons and your daughters and hoping that they will do things that might make it a little bit easier for them or for your grandchildren, or for anyone down the line who is struggling. Because right now we have students who are struggling so hard, they can't get a job that gives them the money to make it easy to pay back these loans. They will never be able to afford to buy a house. They can't afford to get married. They can't afford to establish and build the life that we have built. And so there's got to be some forgiveness somewhere down the line for them. And I, for one, am thrilled if that happens for them because I think they deserve it. And I think that that's what we should be all about is making things better for the human condition in this nation. It's what makes us strong. If we're a strong people, we're a strong nation. 
So that's my little rant. Steve, you got anything to add to that? Oh, I got a whole lot to add to it, but I wanted to give you an opportunity because what I heard from you, and this is standard fare, unfortunately, for many progressives, is a story of kind of like, I don't want to say hopelessness, but kind of a, a, a state of dejection because common sense is so uncommon. And the problem is this, Bev, and, and I'm just going to be real honest. The partisan lines of Democrat and Republican blur the fact that economics, which you stated right up front, bores you to tears. <laughs> and, and the problem is, is that almost everything you said is very, very simple to achieve. I mean, when I say simple, I mean extremely simple. The problem is, is that most vote blue f friends, if you will, uh -huh. the bad guys that are the centrist corporate people that sit there and vote for Wall Street, and then the real progressives out there who are actually fighting for a new deal, those many of them haven't got a clue about economics, don't have a care in the world about economics, but they're the first one to put the sign up saying, we got to reduce the deficit. They don't know anything about it. <laughs> they're going to reduce it. They say, we got to pay down the debt. It's going to get passed on to our children. They don't know anything about what the debt is, but they got signs up at protests talking about reducing it. They have no idea about what it is to pay a fair share because they think that taxes actually pay for programs. So they worry about things that are absolutely non-truths. These things are why Hillary was able to mock Bernie during the primary and many burners hadn't got a clue. Most of them were bored of economics too, except for Bernie <laughs> economic advisor, who we follow down to the sentence, down to the period, down to the comma. We follow that because we understand that without understanding economics, there is no progressive agenda. All we end up doing is talking about how much of a shame it is that people are strapped with student debt, how much of a shame it is that people are dying from a lack of medical care, how much of a shame it is. And there was Hillary cackling away, talking about how, how are you going to pay for it, Bernie? High in the sky. So since most progressives couldn't answer the question, they kept, well, we'll raise taxes on the rich or we'll do. It was all the wrong answers because they didn't understand economics. So the subject that is very boring to most is actually the key to everything that you said you care about, including Medicare for all and student debt elimination, free college, reparations for you know slavery era stuff. And, and quite frankly, for many, many years of marginalization for minority communities, it's we can do it like that. Progressives have to get out of their own way. They've got to stop thinking they understand because for the last 50 years of watching progressives put their fist in the air, but not understand economics, they have failed and we keep sliding further and further and further to the right because progressives, our people, my people, Me. refuse to pay attention to economics and therefore we end up losing. Do you know there's still people out there celebrating Bill Clinton's balanced budget do you realize that they're still bragging about the surplus? Let me explain something to you. A surplus means they have reduced spending and they have raised taxes and they've taken more money out of the economy than they put into the economy. And so what he did was what we call austerity in I the rest of the world. I just say that word, austerity. I understand this stuff. <laughs> this, this is the stuff that, that progressives are celebrating? No. It's an abomination. It it's is. ignorance. And, and, and I, so when you stop talking Democrat versus Republican and you just start saying, who understands economics? Mm -hmm. Those are my people. Because the people that don't are running around talking about raising taxes to pay for things. Well, we got to raise the FICA tax because Social Security's going bankrupt. Wrong. It's not. We can never go bankrupt. This is the thing. United States government is monetarily sovereign, just like Japan, just like Australia, just like Canada, and just like the UK. We, they make their own money. We create our own money. And our states are what we call currency users. So the federal government is a currency issuer. 
and the states are currency users. States and local municipalities can go broke. They have to raise taxes or the federal government has to supplement them by, ta by grants or by federal spending. Now you hear people talking like Obama, if you remember, these are supposed to be our people. Obama saying, we gotta eat our peas, we gotta make tough choices, we gotta do this, we gotta reduce the deficit, it's a moral imperative. This is austerity. This is lethal, lethal to the poor. And so this is what we are up against. That's why I don't focus on the Republicans because the Republicans are the Republicans are the Republicans and they will always be the Republicans. What happens when the enemy is within? What happens when the enemy is bragging about surpluses from the Clinton era? What happens when the enemy is us talking about reducing the deficit, which is the public money? When we don't spend money into the economy, we end up having recessions. When we have recessions, it's not the people that are in the middle and upper class that suffer. It's the poor and the families. So we as progressives, it's our job to clean house in-house. And, and I, don't, I don't even talk about Donald Trump anymore because the fact is we have got to clean up our house or we won't have a progressive agenda. Look at Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She is being counseled by modern monetary theory experts like Stephanie Kelton, Pavlina Cherneva, and all the Modern Money Network. She's not being counseled by the fools like Robert Reich, who everybody loves and celebrates, but Robert Reich is a neoliberal. Robert Reich is a tax and spend guy that does not understand, even though he's your, not yours, but all the progressive movement's hero, he doesn't understand that we don't want a balanced budget. He doesn't understand that we don't need to raise taxes to pay for things. Let me explain something to you, and then I'll let you jump in for a second. When we were talking about Medicare for All at the rally in D.C., I said, we can do way better than that. We can dream a better dream. We can do, build a better tomorrow. We can actually have a new deal instead of dinking and dunking around the edges. People came up to me after that and were like, what were you talking about? I don't understand. And the reality is, is that when Congress says we're going to spend – then we spend because Congress, according to the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, has the power of the purse. They are the ones alone that can write money into existence. The Federal Reserve, all this other nonsense is irrelevant. It is really incumbent upon us, we the progressive movement, to push on Congress to spend on the people. And that's why you see us failing constantly because our movement wants to place taxes ahead of saving lives mm -hmm. and that's where we're at so, so when you look at the, 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 where do you stand on the push we had a few years ago to abolish the federal reserve is i mean that's stupid it's ridiculous uh, the federal reserve all the federal reserve does at all is a spreadsheet it's basically a giant spreadsheet it clears payments between the banks it sets lending rates in other words, if we're going to go in debt to buy a car or buy a house or, or whatever, it sets lending rates. It doesn't do anything. When Congress says we need to spend, the Federal Reserve spends it. It, it puts the money into the Treasury's account, and it's spent. It's that simple. It, 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 they don't spend any money whatsoever. It's not like they create money out of thin air. They create money out of thin air when Congress tells them create money out of thin air. But they don't really do that. So a lot of this is conspiracy junk. People that don't understand economics have things to say, but not ears to hear. And that's why we're here. Well, let me tell you, the reason I say I'm bored is I'm very right brain. I'm a very artistic person. So when I say I'm bored by it, it's not that I'm not trying to understand it. It's just that that's not where my real interest lies. Yeah. But I know it's imperative that we do. And that's why you're here. And I know that we have to spend. I know austerity is our enemy. And I know that there is no reason we cannot have all that we need to have for every person in this nation. Is that not true? That's absolutely correct. Let me tell you something right now. The immigrants coming into this nation, the reason why people are panicked on the right about immigrants, illegal immigrants, these, these people that are coming to our country for a better life, the reason why they're panicked 
is because they feel like there's a scarcity. There won't be enough for them, okay? And because progressives who are supposed to be fighting for equality, fighting for all these things, don't understand economics, then all of a sudden they impose austerity, which makes it so that the right wing goes, see, these knuckleheads are screwing us up. Mm -hmm. And it's like weird because, wow, the right wing hates immigrants because they're afraid immigrants are going to take their food. They're going to take their homes. They're going to take their jobs. Yeah. We, as a progressive movement, have not only the right but the responsibility to understand how this works so that we can provide a federal job guarantee, so we can provide a living wage, so we can provide benefits, so we can provide green energy, so we can provide paid family and medical leave, we provide dental care, we can provide free college, we can eliminate student debt. And this is all very, very possible. There's tons of white papers out there, there's tons of academic research, there's tons of proof you look at Japan, Japan has a 250% debt to GDP ratio, little teeny island of Japan. And all they're doing, all, all the debt is, all it ever is, is simply savings accounts. Mm -hmm. So the people like China, oh, China owns all our debt. China has taken the money they receive and trade. When they, when they sell goods and services in the United States, they receive US dollars. Well, they have a choice. What do we do with this U.S. dollars? Do we cash them in and go bring them back as Chinese yuan? Or do we go ahead and keep them as U.S. dollars to facilitate further commerce between the two nations? Mm -hmm. So they will keep their money and they will invest it into treasury bonds. It's not like we're creating money or borrowing their money. They are putting their money in these bonds that earn a very nominal interest. It's not like we're in debt. This is just money they put in there. And it, it's something that doesn't even need to be done, but we do it anyway. We create money with keystrokes. We don't print money. And, and so people panic about this debt. Does your bank panic about a savings account? I don't think so. But yet we are just so misled by the media, misled by our po politicians, misled by each other at the bar stool and at the fire pit. We tell a lot of myths and legends, and sadly, I could give this speech a hundred times, and people will continue to say the same stuff that keeps us stuck over and over again. They won't change, even though, bottom line, it's not true. It's If you pay off the debt, <clears throat> you've really literally taken all the money out of the economy. That's it. I mean... The debt is really the sum total of every untaxed dollar in the economy. You pay it off, you've literally eliminated money from the economy. And, and unfortunately, people just don't realize this. This goes up in the air. They're loud and proud and ready to fight to raise taxes. For whatever reason, I don't know. But there we go. That's what we're up against. Oliver says, China can buy bonds like anyone else with That's them. That's right. Way to go, Oliver. <laughs> so... When what is a short answer when somebody always says to me, because, you know, my passion is Medicare for all. I want I, I want 100 percent health care, vision, dental, everything everybody needs paid for, given to everybody. I don't think anybody's bank account should be the determining factor in whether they can get preventive care or maintenance meds or anything. I, it should just all be there. Right. Yes. And so when I say this to everybody, I say, this is what we should be doing. It's promoting the general welfare. Correct. It's yes. allowing everybody to have the pursuit of happiness and life and liberty, because without help, we have none of that. So the, what do they always come back at me? How are we going to pay for it? Exactly. So. <laughs> moronic. It, it really is. I mean, you didn't hear them say, well, how are we going to pay for 800 billion for the military? Not one person, oh, we're going to pay for it. We're going to raise taxes. What about inflation? Hyperinflation. We're all going to die. Nobody said that. And there's a reason. Because inherently we know that our nation creates money. But the way that they keep us, it's like I'm going to put coal in your stocking, young man, if you're not a good boy. You know, this is what they do. It's like this mind game that they play to make you feel like, oh, my God, if we go in debt, we'll have to pass it on to our children. The only debt we're passing on to our children is the debt of not spending today to save the environment, to 
sustainable green energy for those people who want to end wars. And I, hey, I want to end wars. But for those people that claim to want to end wars, but then say we got to cut the military budget, we got to cut this, we got to cut that so that we can afford things. First of all, they're wrong. Second of all, Medicare, for example, is deflationary. In other words, it's more efficient than what we have today. Yes. So we may actually have to reduce taxes. Think about that for a oh, minute. Wouldn't that be something? Reduce taxes for Medicare because it's more efficient. Chaos creates a lot of economic activity, right? Inefficiency creates a lot of spending. But when you have something that's efficient, as Warren Mosler says, we may just have to cut taxes to do Medicare for all. But here's something else too. What is the unspoken thing? When you have millions of other people suddenly able to go to the doctor without worrying about going bankrupt, now all of a sudden you need more nurses. Yes. More doctors. Yes. More hospitals. You it's need a jobs more program. <laughs> and machines. Now, what does that do to the economy? Just thinking out loud, does it make it go boom? Yes, of it course. does. It's a jobs program. That's what I've been saying. <laughs> Why would these more? I'm, I, I, I'm try, I, I told myself I wasn't going to use things like moron and stuff like that, but it's so hard because my kids are suffering because these people keep saying the stupid stuff. And I, I'm an activist first, but I, I really want people to understand that here's the way it works. And this is just a short, simple answer. Okay. When Congress spends money into existence, that's the birth of a dollar. It works its way through the economy, and when it's returned as a tax, it's deleted. Every time the government spends, it spends new money every single time. There is no printing money. It's spending new money into existence every single time. Every Social Security check is new money. Granny's old crumpled up dollar bill from 1919 isn't being paid out. It's new money. And every time it's received as a FICA tax, it doesn't get stashed somewhere. It's a digital dollar. It is literally deleted. Seriously, Bev, I want you, I want you to say this with me to prove that, we, that we're alert. What is the birth of a dollar? When Congress spends its money. <laughs> what is the death of a dollar? When it's taxed. <laughs> Bam, you got it. That is the, the circuit. And, it's, and the thing is, if you think of it as like a bathtub, okay, when Congress spends in, this is one of the spigots. But then we have another spigot, and that's tr uh, for trade, if we're an importer or if we're an exporter, right? Well, if we're an exporter, then it's money going in. That's If we're an importer, as we've been for many, many years, right. that's money going out. That's the drain. Mm -hmm. Taxes are a drain. Trade uh, the the importer status is a drain, and then savings and 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 private debt are a drain. But the inbound, the stuff going into the bathtub, okay, public spending, private spending, and imports, not not I mean exports, excuse me. So we have a bathtub full of money, let's say. The only difference is that we have drained far too much out of the economy. And we are in a situation now where we are fast approaching. We are fast approaching, sadly, another recession. And if we're not careful, we're going to see a lot of good people really, really hurting as a result of economic illiteracy, especially within the progressive movement. It's in our hands. We could fix this. Yeah, by electing progressives who will spend this money into being. <laughs> How about what happened? Let me ask you a question. Do you know who brought the EPA into existence? Actually, no, I don't know. Richard Nixon. He was ah, a Republican. I should have guessed. <laughs> now, here's why I'm saying this. I'm guessing Tricky Dick was not a big environmentalist. I'm guessing Tricky Probably Dick. Probably not. <laughs> he was not like a major progressive. Now, he was certainly not as bad as some. But my point is, is that Tricky Dick was had his back against the wall on the environment because people made demands. Mm -hmm. The people made demands. And I guarantee you those hippies and lefties and all that stuff, peace signs up in the air, protesting the Vietnam War and protesting the environment. Mm -hmm. 
certainly were not Nixon supporters. They did not vote for Nixon to be in office, but yet they got Nixon to put the EPA in. Do you see the progressive give up strategy? We can't do anything unless we have these other people in there. That's the progressive give up strategy. That's why I don't talk about Trump because I'm too worried about our own people playing the progressive give up strategy. We have to fight as if right now. Forget all, this is why sidetracking an entire movement, focusing on Donald Trump's comb over, focusing on his sexual proclivities, his belly, his little hands, and all his bad teeth <laughs> is really, really hurting us because it takes years to make people understand <clears throat> that we can afford a new deal. It takes a lot of effort because this is a very sad truth, but this is my experience. People that don't understand what I'm saying within our own movement mistakenly believe that I'm a Republican or something like that because I'm talking about the fact that taxes do not pay for programs. Taxes are extremely important, but they don't pay for anything. The reason why taxes are so important is because taxes are what gives value to our dollar. Taxes are what makes our dollar worth something because the imposition of a tax payable only in the government's currency means that you have to have that currency to pay your tax, which by extension makes that dollar worth $1 in tax credit. So you have to have a dollar to pay your taxes. You can't have a Bitcoin to pay your taxes. You can't have a Chinese uh, yuan to pay your taxes, nor a Japanese yen, nor a UK ster pound sterling, nor an Australian dollar or a Canadian dollar. You have to have a US dollar to pay your taxes. So when people say it's the petrodollar, they're wrong. They're ignorant. They're wrong. It's completely wrong, and it sidelines the movement chasing boogeymen. It is the tax that drives the currency. Back way back, many, many moons ago, whenever you had a sovereign free-floating fiat currency, the king would say, hey, guys, I want to go ahead and build an aqueduct. I want to build a new castle. I want to build a roadway. I want to build a marketplace. I want to build public baths, whatever they did. And so what he said was, how do I make these people, my townspeople, build me these things? Mm -hmm. well, shoot, they're happy. They're content. They're living. They're farming. They're fishing. They're doing whatever. How do I get them to build these things? Oh, I can make them slaves. Well, that's not going to make them very happy. I know what I'll do. I'll pay them in my gold, my, my own gold with my little face on it. Here, I'll give them a coin. What do I want this coin for? It doesn't do me any good. You're right. I'll impose a tax on your house, payable only in that coin. Now, the only way you can get that coin is to come work for me to build this castle. What do you think? Will you take the coin now? Yeah, I'll take the coin. So now the guy gets up off his butt, stops fishing, and goes and builds an aqueduct, a castle, a roadway, a marketplace, whatever. And that is the birth of a dollar right there. And, you know, the king didn't need that dollar to pay taxes. The king wasn't saying, oh, my God, if I don't get that coin back, I'm not going to be able to give him health care. The king was just like, hey, I want you to build me a castle. So he introduced the currency. The currency had a tax on it. The tax made the thing worth something. <clears throat> and that's where we are today. People just don't realize it. And so this is a huge thing for people to understand so that we can, in fact, get back to the business of being progressives and fighting for what we want, not just fighting against what they have. Fight what we want. Start presenting what we want. So when so I when talk, I talk about, about electing electing people, people on the of course, of course, like, course, like Alexandria, it's because I know that they are the ones who will make the demands for what we want. And is um and they're going to be part of Congress that will vote it into being, right? Let me ask you a question. How many of these progressive candidates that you know of, that you love and cherish, how many of them do you think are saying we got to raise taxes to pay for programs? You know, I don't know. Well, I do know because Alexandria says we have to raise taxes on the wealthy. She does Every say that. Every single <laughs> one of them thinks that we have to. So let's put this in order of operations. Let's play algebra for a minute, Okay. So if I say, I want to give you health care, Bev, because you're dying, you've got something, or, or I want this child over here with autism to get the therapy they need right now. Yes. Here's what the problem is with the modern vote blue mindset. We need to get that child health care 
But before we do it, we've got to raise taxes on the rich to do it. And we've got to cut the military to do it. And we've got to do this, that, and the other to do it. You young man, it's not our fault. It's the Republicans' fault for not raising taxes. That's why you don't have that. They're bad. And I'm sorry. And it's wrong. And they should always do it. The fact is, is that you fought a battle that was unnecessary. You right. placed a barrier in front of that child's health and well-being. And that's ignorance. And that's the stuff that we're fighting against because we want to save lives. We're not here to win partisan battles. We're here to give people health care. We're here to give people a free education. We're here to get rid of those student loans. I have $127,000 of student loans. Oh, my God. Yes. And so yeah, you when you have how many degrees? Well, I have I have two master's degrees and I got several uh, seminars into a Ph.D., in organizational change management and leadership. So, very but the well thing is, is that Bev, forever, we have heard about healthcare should be a right. right. We've heard about, I've heard about this my whole life. And I've heard all these things about how we should cut the military. We should do this, we should do, and all I've seen is the military balloon. Yes. All I've seen is the cost of school balloon. Exactly. All I have seen is people go into private debt to the point where they can't even breathe. They're scared to death they'll lose a job. And they, neoliberalism has privatized everything, the Hillary Clinton plan, to go ahead and just give it to some people. We're only going to give some benefits to some people because we can't possibly afford that, you know, because we got to pay for it with taxes. See, I want your ears to get so burned with this stuff that when you hear one of our candidates come out there and say that they've got to raise taxes to pay for stuff, that you know when you look at that child with autism that's not getting treatment, that the reason is because they put a barrier in front of getting to that. Because think about this. Taxes are used as a brake or a gas pedal in the economy. They don't pay for something. So right now, the wealthy have amassed huge amounts of money. Taking that money away via taxes only takes some money away from them. It does nothing for the poor, though, because right. money doesn't get respent without a new bill from Congress to spend. Taxes do not fund spending, literally. So when you say you care about green energy, the only way green energy happens is if you spend on green energy. The only way you get government investment for cancer research is to spend on government for you know cancer research, not yeah. by cutting somebody else's spending, not by reducing the deficit, not by eliminating the debt or any other nonsense. And this is this is a huge, huge deal, Bev. We get nowhere, literally nowhere, if we don't fix this. And, and we've been fighting. We've got a huge movement brewing. So. Well, we have a question we need to answer from a viewer. He says there's a very real constraint on how much money can be printed before inflation kicks in. The yes. amount of stagnant production and unused resources. Do we have any idea how much that is? Completely incorrect. First of all, we don't print money. I already stated that in, in very strong language, as a matter of fact. When Congress spends money, it's always new money. When Congress taxes, it always deletes money. So there's a drain and a spigot, right? And bottom line, we don't just print money. That's gold standard logic. We left the gold standard. The Bretton Woods Accord ended in 1972. Yes. There is no more gold standard. Think about this. Gold, you have this much gold. It's like a pizza pie, right? When you go ahead and you print so much money, let's say we print enough for 12 slices, all right? But the gold okay. supply doesn't expand. We just have this much gold. Now, all of a sudden, we say, well, we want to cut that pizza into 16 slices. Now you've devalued the dollar or you've devalued the slices or you have created inflation in this regard. But that's not what goes on in a free-floating sovereign fiat currency that's not convertible and not pegged to a commodity. Unfortunately, people in our movement, and it is, it, it's absolutely appalling to me that people don't do their he history research to realize we left the gold standard in 1970. Nixon took us off that too. That I, remember. Gold <laughs> I remember that was my first year in college and That's I remember it well. I, I, it, it is appalling to me because I spend more time trying to convince progressives to stop snatching, stop snatching 
defeat from the jaws of victory because they're just so obsessed with this mindless right wing economics of Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman, the biggest right wing nut job that literally destroyed the country and has been thoroughly discredited, by the way, not before he got the Nobel Prize. But Milton Friedman, this jackass sat there and told us all that if you print too much money, you're going to be inflation. So what he did was he created a system, basically, that when good times are coming in, okay, you'll pay off your private debt. But when bad times come, you'll go ahead and go and deepen private debt. This is the neoliberal way. And this is what Hillary Clinton did. This is what Reagan did. This is what Bush did. This is what Clinton did. This is what Obama did. And gosh bless it, this is what 45's doing. Okay. It's the same nonsense. Okay. Another response from Ken. What's that? <laughs> Ken comes back and he says, You're dissembling, not answering. I just what? answered the question. It's not true. Quantity theory of money. That's what you're trying to say. There you go. Quantity theory of money is bunk. Okay. There is no such thing as printing too much money. That's so, what is the constraint stuff. on government creation of new money? All money is created by the government, unless you want bank credit. That's the only two choices. You have bank credit, which you have to pay back and it zeroes out, or you have a brand new net financial asset, which is government spending. What we have done, which is the neoliberal way, is we have made the economy almost wholly dependent on bank credit, which is a really, really disgusting neoliberal strategy for keeping the economy going. This is the Milton Friedman strategy I just laid out. Go into private debt. We're going to go ahead and privatize Social Security. We're going to privatize this. It's horrific that any progressive even remotely thinks that way. It's even worse that they still support Milton Friedman, the worst right-wing hack of them all, okay, that has literally done more to kill our country than any other thing we've ever done. No joke. The worst. So the constraint on new money is actually being created. It's real resources. So if we don't have the resources to provide health care, in other words, we don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough hospitals, we don't have enough this, that, and the other, we've created scarcity in the actual real resource. It has nothing to do with printing money. Okay, We don't print money. That's a gold standard operation. It ended many, many moons ago. But who's creating the scarcity? Government? Who's creating it? It's that, okay, so today, our economy can only handle so many nurses, so many doctors, so many lawyers, so many whatevers, right? We have, we have quite a shortage right now. That's right. And it's because our government has reduced the deficit. It keeps Bingo! Okay? The government. The whole <laughs> moronic thing about printing money, which doesn't exist. There's just enough printed money to satisfy ATM needs and banking needs, like when you go to a teller. Otherwise, the rest is digital. It's all digital. Right. That's the way it is in Japan. Japan cannot crack 2% inflation, but they have 250% debt to GDP. This is the printing money thing that is not happening anyway. But 250% debt to GDP, and they can't crack 2%. They don't have a petro yen. There is no, it's just unfathomable that we're still dealing with this. It really is. And this is why you don't see progressives fighting for a new deal, because they don't understand economics. Okay, so he said, good, he got the question, he liked that. And then he said, so, um, and now I can't find the other one. He asked another one. Um, crud. Here we go, let me find it. So finally an answer. And he says, how much room do we have for new spending? <laughs> well, you know, it just depends on what we're really trying to do, right? Think about this. If we go to green energy, there's a huge amount of spending that goes on petro, you know, petro, not petrodollars, excuse me, petroleum products, right? Mm -hmm. Really significantly decrease because the sun is kind of ubiquitous. So is wind, so is water. So it just depends on whether we aggressively attack sustainability or whether we just stick with the model that we are now where we're burning fossil fuels. And but, we're actually going backward in that regard because right now there's been more and more money pushed at fossil fuels and exactly. pushed at coal and in the money that was being invested into the green energy companies that were actually creating the best jobs 
that money has gone away. So, so right now, Stephanie Kelton, Bernie Sanders, lead dog over there at Sanders Institute, et cetera, is advancing several major policy propositions that will radically change the way society is. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is pushing for it as well. And what she's doing, which is very slick, by the way, she's playing to the vote blues that don't know economics. Uh -huh. Rather than fighting with them, which I want the fight, I want to fight them hard, but she's choosing to avoid the fight. So what she's doing is she's saying, we'll pay for these programs with a Wall Street speculation tax. We'll pay for these programs with these other Pagovian taxes, which are like sin taxes or bad, bad tax, right? You did some bad carbon tax, bad, bad, bad. So what they do is by, by doing the Wall Street speculation, it deters, you know, high speed trading or speculation, right? But as that decreases, the money decreases too. So it's not really paying for anything, but it makes you feel good. It makes you think that we're paying for programs with it. And since people are just unwilling to budge from, you know, learning, she's playing to that. She understands it. You notice she's not saying, well, raise payroll taxes to accommodate this right. because it's stupid. But this is what you see. Typically. Well, we're going to have to raise it 5%. We're going to have to raise this 20%. Um, Chris Fleming, and hi, Chris. Chris is a friend of mine, and he's a very active part of our Madison County, our revolution here that I just got off the ground here a few weeks ago. And I, he's a college student. And he's just an awesome kid. So thank you for your question. He says, are there any resources yeah. you can recommend for a progressive who knows little about economics? And yes. there is a Facebook group that has every link you could ever hope to have. Is that not true? There's a couple of them. So <laughs> I'm going to, first of all, let me just be real fair. I am the founder of a group called Real Progressives. We're a Pennsylvania charity going for our nonprofit status right now. Um, we are devoted to a new deal and to teaching modern monetary theory and teaching how economics works. But there are other groups such as the Modern Money Network that are having the uh, MMT second annual conference in New York City on the 28th through the 30th of September. Also, Sanders Institute now has a lot of good stuff. Levy Institute has a lot of good stuff. Um, you can go to a website called New Economic Perspectives. Um, you can also go uh, to what was the Minsky's. I mean, there's a host of great opportunities out there. Levy Institute, Bard College, UMKC. But look up, anytime you want, look up Stephanie Kelton, Look up Bill Mitchell, Dr. Bill Mitchell from Australia. Look up uh, Matt Forstater. Look up Fidel Kaboob. Um, look up, uh, you know, Stephanie Kelton, obviously, Pavlina Cherneva, L. Randall Ray. Um, there's an incredible amount. And, you know, quite frankly, this might be even more disturbing than you'll ever know. Bernie Sanders' chief economist, when he was, when he had the Senate Budget Committee, was Stephanie Kelton. Yes. Then when he ran for president, she was his economic advisor. And so was Jamie Galbraith, L. Randall. The whole MMT community was helping men, too. Then when he started Sanders Institute, you had Stephanie Kelton take over there as well. And so what is mind numbing to me is progressives who claim to love Bernie, who claim to want a new deal, don't know this. This. Ken, thank you. He says um, www.moslereconomics.com. So thank you. He wants to know, um, he said, since we have all this excess capacity, why no deflation? Well, the reality is, is that they've made us get to the point where we are so far in debt from, uh, what do you call it, from uh, student loans. Student loan, we got $1.4 trillion in student loans right now. That is incredible. People will never, ever see that loan go away by their own payments. We're not yeah. talking about the $1,000 you borrowed in 1972. <laughs> People like myself carrying a mortgage on right. top of their backs just to stay relevant in the employment business. Um, most people have car payments, house payments. They have student debt. And more importantly, most of our society has been divorced. So you've got tremendous amount of child support being taken out and you've got people that look good on paper until you look at the bottom line and they're actually in the red. They're actually negative numbers. 
that are living hand to mouth and they make six figures. We've got to redefine the way we understand economics. Bottom line is we have tons of raw materials. We have incredible amounts of untapped labor and underutilized labor. And we've depressed that so that the capitalists, the, the big, big wigs, these multinationals can get us on the cheap and keep us destitute. Reality is you give everybody a living wage with a federal job guarantee, which is what Stephanie Kelton is advancing and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is advancing, okay? If you go for a job guarantee, you eradicate involuntary unemployment forever. You provide a living wage. Now the entire economy is pegged to the labor standard, not the gold standard, the labor standard. And now what you've done is you've prevented regular people from being destitute ever again. And more importantly, women who have been in bad situations, domestic violence, or people in Flint, Michigan, who still don't have clean water, they can literally pick up and leave and have a job tomorrow. Exactly. Okay. So when you think about this, you think about healthcare as a right. Well, we have the capacity to do that. We just don't have the political will to do that. Too many progressives are waiting for a leader to tell them it's okay to do that. They're not willing to fight for it now. They got to wait for somebody above to say it's okay. It's like, oh, well, okay. Hillary said it now, so I guess it's okay. Isn't anyway, it that's the kind of vote blue that I don't have a whole lot of stuff in common with. No, okay. <laughs> Fire breathing MMT progressive, and I want a new deal yesterday. So, how much space do we have? How much spending do we have? Well, you got to look at sectoral balances. Okay, and that's back to that bathtub analogy that I was giving you. Mm -hmm. When you look at the amount of public debt, you look at the amount of private debt, and you look at the balance of trade, right now our bathtub is pretty low, okay? The people that are wealthy have lots of money, they're not even feeling it. The people right. on the bottom, like myself, even with me having a good job, are struggling paycheck to paycheck. The average person is struggling paycheck to paycheck. So they're doing whatever it takes to get a dollar. They're sacrificing their health. They're sacrificing their children. They're sacrificing their families. They're making bad nutrition decisions. They're making bad decisions across the board because they can't even get a break. They can't even get rest. They can't even do any of the basic things that they tell you to do to lead a healthy life. So people are literally destitute. And we've got progressives talking about raising taxes, raising FICA. It's, it's, it's an abomination. That's why, why look at Trump? Why look at Trump when our own, inter univer here, universal basic income is a neoliberal plot to make us poorer, okay? There is no peg to the economy. It, think of it like this. There is no, there's nothing to prevent prices from rising. So you don't need just money. You need housing, you need uh, clothing, you need food, you need shelter, you need all these different things. But there's nothing to prevent that from raising up. So basic income, first of all, you're not going to get enough money to make it worthwhile. And second of all, there's no productive output, so it's by definition inflationary. So the idea is have a federal job guarantee, one that pro provides everybody a job that wants one, federally funded, locally administered, so you're serving your local community or you're serving local nonprofits, and then expand Social Security like Bernie Sanders had said and provide that, expand it, give the cost of living increases to the elderly and expand it for other people that want to have that Social Security, maybe they can't work or whatever. But the idea of a universal basic income is a neoliberal plot to eliminate all the social safety nets. This is what libertarians have used forever. Milton Friedman, again, came up with this idea of a negative income tax rate as a basic income to go ahead and fuel the capitalist tirade to take away the public space. This is what the Koch brothers want. This is what Paul, Ron Paul wants. This is what all these people that despise government spending want. They want a basic income. Milton Friedman even said the only problem with capitalism is there's not enough capitalism. There's not enough money. We got to give the people more money to make capitalism better. Okay. They didn't say anything about 
the services. Money isn't the big deal. It's the services that you get. It's the real resources that you get. You can't eat money, you know that? But you can eat bread that money buys. And so the reality is, is a universal basic income doesn't do anything but provide a Trojan horse for the neoliberals, the libertarians, and others who despise government spending to rip apart the social safety nets. In fact, if you read some of the stuff out there, they are outrageously bold and willing to tell you flat out, we'd rather give you money so you can make your own decisions and then we'll get rid of those bad programs. So a uh, UBI is not, it's not a good thing. I'm telling you right now, I am all for expanding social security, which in essence is a basic income. I'm all about removing the FICA tax, which is a very regressive tax on the poor. And I'm all about making sure that everyone gets a living wage, not some chump wage, but a living wage with a federal job guarantee serving their local communities. So no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of those people that's for a basic income. I understand that there are various uh, plots and schemes out there where they do this stuff, but there's absolutely no value in it whatsoever. It seems to me if we had this federal job guarantee where we're working into our, putting our talents into our communities, that people would be able to work in areas that are passionate to them, that, That's you right. know, where they're using their talents and their interests and their passions to do something and getting paid to do it rather than what the capitalists are telling us. And I am, I hate capitalism. I'll tell you now, I am, it, to me, it is what has caused all of this. Neoliberalism. And, what? It's I, I would call it neoliberalism because even democratic socialism is based on capitalism. Bernie calls it ca you know capitalism with a conscience. So <laughs> it's a spectrum, right? You, you got a spectrum, but neoliberalism is a bipartisan effort to privatize services and allow somebody to get rich off of our desperation. And that, my friend, is not any way to run a government. That is not the way to run healthcare. It's not the way to run education. And it's most certainly not the right way to run an energy policy that we desperately need to stop wars and save lives. It's so I definitely I, not a way to live, is it? It's no I way don't, to live. Liberalism is a cancer that creates a lot of mental Ill illness. And I will tell you right now, we talk about gun control. If you got rid of neoliberalism and you made it so that we were a compassionate society that understood how economics works, we would eliminate so much blood and violence in this country because people are desperate. They are feeling the pinch of being cut out of the American dream. And so when we sit there and we do things that block people from having a good life, instead of making it something that's inclusive, think about this. I know Republicans love their children too. And the thing Republicans do is they say, I don't want to pay for your bad decisions. Good. Taxes don't pay for spending. So the good news is your tax dollar isn't paying for her abortion and your tax dollar isn't paying for that bomb. It's the public money. So when we get past that, we realize that we don't have to raise taxes to take care of our veterans. When I, I spoke at a Trump rally, I didn't know it was a Trump rally. I got looped in thinking that it was a march for, for truth. And it turned out to be a Trump rally. And I'm sitting there with my real progressives shirt on. I've got my fist in the air with the, you know, and I'm, I'm like, oh boy, I, I really am at a Trump rally. What do I do? And I sat there and I said, you know what? I'm going to go in there and I'm going to talk about a new deal. I'm going to talk to them about health care for veterans, yes. returning veterans. And I'm telling you right now, this is why I know this works. I'm sitting there with these people that absolutely wouldn't, wouldn't do a thing for Hillary Clinton, wouldn't do it other than put her in jail. They wouldn't yeah. do a thing for anybody, right? But when I talked to them about the points that they cared about, I was able to make the exact same case for Medicare for all, but for veterans. I was able to make the exact case for a job guarantee, especially for those people in rural areas who have been cut out of the job pool. I was able to make the exact same case. MMT gets rid of all the partisan strongholds. And you realize the Democrats have been lying to you for a long time about needing to raise taxes to pay for stuff. And when you realize that, that should really piss you off. It should really make you angry. And the flip side is, is that when you look at the Republicans and they talk about the national debt and they talk about, we're passing on debt to our children and all that stuff. That's another 
lie. When they talk about Social Security going broke or that so-and-so raided the trust fund, it's all a giant lie because it's just keystrokes. How do you run out of keystrokes? I mean, literally, it's ridiculous. And, and you begin to say, wait a minute, hold on. How many lies did they tell me today? How many politicians are lying to me today? And this is like, if you have ever seen the movie The Matrix. Yeah. Neo's walking around, everybody's dressed nice and neat, and everybody's eating steaks and drinking wine. And, and all of a sudden, they unplug him from the Matrix. And he realizes that Earth is friggin' foobar. I mean, it's polluted, it's dark, it's black, it's yucky, it's gross. And he's got this funny thing on the back of his head. And, you know, the point I'm making is, is that when you understand MMT, you can't listen to the garbage anymore and feel good about eating it. No matter how much they were part of your team before, you realize that they're lying to you. And so we have to fix this for the 99% to truly have a new deal and to take the power back. I mean, imagine this. If your employer doesn't have the ability to hold keeping you destitute over your head, you suddenly get to make choices now. You suddenly can tell your employer, you know what? I'm not coming back to work if this is what you're going to do to me. If you're going to sit there and treat me like crap, I can get a federal job tomorrow. I can walk out my door tomorrow and work in my own backyard with child care right up the street as part of our job guarantee, I can sit there and not have to deal with your abuse. And when you think about that, that's freedom. That's real freedom for the people. And you can serve your local community. You can serve the elderly. You can serve the children. You can serve the school system. You can serve the environment. You can clean up. You can do whatever. Whatever your local community wants done. Because I know when I go around here in my local community, I see all kinds of stuff left undone. My kids only go to gym class like once every three weeks. They go to music class like once a month. Why? Right. Back in the day, we used to go every day to band class or every day to chorus or every day to art. And now it's yes. like, well, we only do it a third Thursday because we run out of money. There are no programs. They're just, exactly. It, you know, it, it's so upsetting. I had band every day. I started playing in band in third grade. I had great music program and great instructors and all of that has gone away. Now I had lousy art. We had no art, but, but I had the band, you know? So um, it, it just, what I'm hearing you say makes so much sense, but in my ear, I'm hearing them say to me, but that means the government's our employer and we don't want the government making the jobs or creating the jobs. The government is us. Exactly. We, That's what I always say. <laughs> since, when did, since when did Democrats become the party of Reagan? Since when did they start acting like Reaganites? I, I tell you, it's. I feel like I'm fighting against Reaganites half the time. And it's like it happened with, with it happened back uh, with the the before the third way, the Democratic Leadership Council, which was actually funded by the Koch brothers and the Clintons. And that's when we got much of this neoliberalism were moved to the right. And yeah. then, of course, the DLC went away and it's moved into the third way, which is birth of a dollar. When government creates the spending. When Congress appropriates the funds. So ever somebody asks you, how are you going to pay for it? The answer is always when Congress appropriates the spending. That's the I answer. I love that. I love that. And then when, they, when you ask about, are you going to just print more money? The answer is no, we don't print money. And we haven't printed money since the gold standard ended. And we don't print money. We only spend money when we have a bill. We don't create random money. We don't print money. We don't do that. It just doesn't happen. And when you hear people say, what are you going to do, print more money? It's going to make you crazy going forward. I've infected you now with truth. And you're going to go ballistic next time you hear somebody go, what are you going to do, print more money? It's going to go, oh, my God. It's like nails down a chalkboard. It's like pure, It's like wearing a dunce cap and thinking you're cool. I mean, that's how bad that is. <laughs> so, um, we're out of time, but Ken did ask one more question for you. Why wouldn't those jobs be full time instead of just in periods of low employment? I'm not they, sure what they, it is. It could be anything. The bottom line is this. A federal job guarantee is exactly that. So it's it's a counter cyclical balance 
Okay. So what will happen is naturally people will roll on to the job guarantee and roll off the job guarantee. Okay. You either want an unemployed workforce or an employed buffer stock workforce. Okay. So as, as the economy picks up, people can choose to go back into private sector to make more money. But if the private sector is laying off rather than sitting there getting your measly nothing burgers from unemployment, you get a living wage and you get to do something. If you want to serve your local, you can serve it forever. It's a job guarantee. It's not dependent on the economy. If you want a job in your local community, you can walk out and get a job in your local community. That's why the federal job guarantee is so important to changing the way society is, to making it more fair, and, and really, really to making equality amongst the races and amongst the genders really come to be and eliminate our need for private debt, payday lenders, you name it. And to stop hating the immigrants because, hey, we could all get a job guarantee. Stop saying taxpayer dollars. Right. It's not taxpayer dollars. <laughs> Steve, you have been, I've been taking notes in case you didn't know. I'm, I've been here scribbling, scribbling. I've taken up a whole post-it bed. <laughs> and now, I thank you. I, want to be real clear. Me. I spoke as a lay person as opposed to getting real deep nuanced into like economic jargon. I tried really hard. I practiced trying to mentally say things in a way. I probably still messed it up. But no, I you did a great job. I wish we had another hour to go because there's you are so full of information and I knew you would present it well. And you helped me because now I have good answers to give to the, the naysayers who keep saying, well, how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? It's just like when they say, um, well, we can't afford to take care of the immigrants. We need to be taking care of our own. And I always say back to them, why aren't we doing both? Bingo. And we can. Absolutely. We absolutely can. Thank you so much. And I, if I haven't told you before, you have an incredible smile. And, uh -huh. and you've been smiling this whole time. So I can tell. I mean, this is your passion. And you are absolutely the perfect person to be here. And I hope that you'll come back um, and we can delve into this some more in the future. And thank you so much to the audience for the comments and the questions. I love that participation. It was so great to have it. Um, this will be posted on the Progressive Talk. Remember to be here Wednesday nights at 7 Central. And thanks again, Steve. Good luck to you in everything you're doing. And I will be following you more closely. One more thing. Yes. Alice Winningham and I will be doing a podcast soon called Macro and Cheese. It's a joke, macroeconomics and cheese, to kind of like entertainment and economics. All to right. be able to look out for that. And of course, you can come find me at Real Progressives or Modern Monetary Theory for Real Progressives. Anytime. Okay, and we will post that link. I'll go get that link and post it on our page too. And uh, I'll promote that for you because I, I that sounds like a lot of fun. I just thank you so much. And um, this is what we need to know, people, is this kind of information because then we can actually go be the change we wish to see in the world. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much, Beth.